Hello, and welcome to the excerpt. I'm Dana Taylor. It's called Apophis. The asteroid has a tiny chance of hitting Earth on Friday the 13th in April of 2029. That chance depends on it being hit by another asteroid or some other object in space at just the right angle to redirect it and send it our way. To date, scientists haven't zeroed in on any imminent asteroid threats, you know, the kind that wiped out dinosaurs. But Does that mean definitively that there couldn't be more hurtling towards Earth? How at risk is mankind and what steps are scientists taking to avert a catastrophic collision? And is it possible or even a good idea to attempt to rearrange things in space? Joining us now to discuss how scientists are working to literally save the planet is scientist and author Robin George Andrews. His new book, How to Kill an Asteroid, is out now. Thanks for being on the excerpt, Robin. Hey, thanks so much for having me. In your book, you vividly described the impact of a football field-sized asteroid like Apophis hitting Earth. City killers, asteroids large enough to wipe out an entire metropolitan area, are terrifying. What's the actual risk of one of these asteroids hitting Earth? So, yes, uh, asteroids that we often think of as threatening the planet are these sort of planet-killer-sized asteroids, which are several miles wide, crash into the planet, wipe everyone out, the sort of thing that happened to the dinosaurs. But actually, the threat, as you mentioned, are these city killer asteroids. Now, these are very, very small, you know, tens to hundreds of meters, so, you know, a few hundred feet. And there are about 25,000 of them in near-Earth orbits. They orbit the sun sort of relatively close to the Earth. The problem is scientists have only found, you know, just under half of those. So those ones aren't a threat. The orbits aren't coming in contact with Earth in the next century or much longer. But we don't know what the others are doing. So until we find those and find out what they're doing, you know, we don't really know what the day-to-day threat is. So, you know, keep paying your mortgage, but, um, you know, just uh, hope that scientists will speed this detection quest up a little bit. So you're saying that an asteroid large enough to wipe out life on Earth, as it did with the dinosaurs, that's not a valid fear, really, to focus on these smaller, more frequent asteroid strikes. That's right. Within a human lifetime or several human lifetimes, it's like a, a planet killer is not something that we should worry about. You know, we've found pretty much all of the ones that orbit around Earth, but these city killers are stealthy. They're really small and they can come out of nowhere. So, yeah, they're, they're the things that, you know, again, not a day to day worry. Um, but if you live to 100, there's something like a one in 200 chance of a city killer finding its way towards Earth. Could land in the ocean, could be fine, but could hit a city. So, you know, how lucky do we feel, really? Two years ago, NASA's Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART mission, successfully altered the trajectory of an asteroid. How did they do it, and how were they able to keep it from bumping into another asteroid, potentially changing its trajectory? So cool, this mission. So they, NASA have long wanted to test like a planetary defense technique, and in this case, it was hitting an asteroid really hard with a spacecraft to change its trajectory. Now, as you say, you couldn't do that with any asteroid. If it was just on its own, you could deflect it onto a dangerous core. So what they did is they picked a binary asteroid system. So there's a larger asteroid called Didymos, and around that, like a moon, is one called Dimorphos. And they reason that if they hit Dimorphos, the moon-like asteroid, it would change its orbit around the bigger one, but it wouldn't change their overall orbit around the sun. So it was a perfectly safe way to practice saving the world. It's pretty clever. You've said that asteroid impacts could be the one natural disaster we can prevent. The DART mission was a significant milestone. How do you see it shaping planetary defense strategies in the future as a global effort called for here? Yeah, so, I mean, it took a lot of work to get to the point where, you know, a a space agency could even test this technique. But it's a very brute force technique. You know, an asteroid's coming towards you. What do you do? You swat it away. But it requires an incredible amount of precision. Like you're hitting a relatively tiny target moving tens of thousands of miles an hour through space with another tiny target. And you have to hit it not too hard to stop it breaking apart because that'd be like turning a cannonball into a shotgun pellet shot. Um, You have to hit it just right. You have to, you know, kind of know what the structure of the asteroid is like before. So it's not a simple matter of hitting as hard as you can. Um, But what it has done is inaugurate, you know, Earth's ability to defend itself from these city killer asteroids. So I think other space agencies are going to start practicing their own method of like deflecting asteroids. I think China recently announced that they're going to do just that. Robin, can you give us some insight into the scientists leading the charge in asteroid defense? 
So they're not what you would think of as, as typical scientists. I mean, I argue, argue there are no typical scientists in a way, but if you think of the most stereotypical image of a scientist sort of thing, you know, they are not that at all. They, you know, the, the leader of America's planetary defense efforts uh, was heavily inspired by Star Trek and uh, his sort of second in command. She went to see the premiere of Star Wars uh, in Hollywood in 1977. So they are the sort of like kids that didn't grow up who thought, hmm, I want to do something really cool, like something really sort of gung ho, sort of uh, sort of out there kind of science. But also, it just happens to be science that will make a difference to billions of people. So they're very, very outgoing, very, very happy to chat, very, very exuberant, exhilarated about things. You know, they they just seem like they've never grown up, and as a result, we're all safer for it. So. Spacecast 2020 made predictions about space defense initiatives. Can you share a bit about the history of Spacecast 2020, how it came about, and a few of the predictions? Yeah, so Spacecast 2020 was a really interesting report that was commissioned essentially by the Air Force um, to try and work out what sort of threats that America might face um, in 2020, as seen from the perspective of someone in the, like, the late 80s, early 90s. And most of these uh, sort of documents produced by, you know, various members of the Air Force were talking about, you know, uh, superiority against enemy nations, you know, satellite warfare, things like that. But um, yes, Lindley Johnson, who's who's now America's planetary defense officer, thought, well, wouldn't it be good if the Air Force could use its technology and its know-how to maybe stop asteroids crashing into the planet? Um, And um, it kind of sort of foresaw that there would be an urgent need to do that because if you wait long enough an asteroid or a comet is going to hit the earth and uh, wouldn't it be nice to do something about that so yeah it took a while but um you know that kind of effort to save the world from asteroids actually came to fruition it only took several decades (laughs) nasa is currently working on this space-based Near-Earth Object Surveyor Telescope. It's designed to track asteroids and comets. The target launch date is late 2027. What technological or scientific breakthroughs do you think are crucial to achieving the goal of not only tracking, but averting collision? Right. So Neo Surveyor is is super cool. It's basically the closest we're going to have to, you know, a sort of asteroid scout um you know maybe even a sniper sort of thing it's going to look in the infrared um and asteroids like everything in space glow in the infrared you know it's like that kind of thermal imaging technology you see in a lot of films and things and the problem with asteroids at the moment is that they are detected when sunlight reflects off them um which is good enough to kind of get a broad idea of the size and where they're going but infrared like can just see all these asteroids, even if they're like illuminated by the sun's glare, if they're hidden like a match in front of a bonfire, um, it can immediately tell the size of the asteroid. It doesn't matter like what it's made of. And basically, this is going to find like almost all of the remaining city killers in near Earth orbit that like ground based telescopes haven't been able to find. So that's really incredible. And with that, at the same time, scientists are developing extra technology to help work out how to deflect or destroy these asteroids. In fact, scientists in New Mexico recently tested a way of developing sort of like a simulated nuclear explosion in a lab. It's not dangerous at all, but they've used that to kind of see if they could irradiate an asteroid to sort of knock it back. And it turns out they can. So, you know, we're living in in good times in that sense. You mentioned films, and I was going to ask you about exactly that. If we were talking about a Hollywood movie, the scientists in the film would be discussing a nuclear option. And you're saying there is a real life nuclear option being worked on here. Yeah, in fact, um, for some scenarios, uh, as our technology is currently, uh, a nuclear um, explosive device, as they're known, or NEDs, are probably the best option because they deliver the most energy in like the easiest and shortest amount of time. So say you have a city killer coming towards Earth. If we have less than 10 years, for example, or the asteroid is way bigger than that, um, and we do have more time, you can't just slam spacecraft into it and knock it off course it, it it might not knock it off course in time it might be too big in in that situation what you'd want to do is actually get a spacecraft to fly it basically itself to the asteroid not drill a hole into it but park nearby and ex- and detonate its nuclear explosive and what that does is it irradiates the surface of the asteroid one one surface the uh, surface breaks apart it turns into like a jet of debris and that basically turns the asteroid into a rocket pushing the asteroid off course and it will do that 
more emphatically than like uh, a spacecraft crashing into it. There are obviously problems with using nuclear warheads uh, in space. It will cause a lot of political tension. You know, no one wants to see anything nuclear explosive being launched into the sky. So this would be a a, a real emergency. But in the face of doing that or doing nothing, I'm presuming like some country or countries of the world would rather, you know, opt for the nuclear option. But yeah, it's a real life option. It's just difficult to test. Private companies are becoming increasingly involved in space exploration. Recently, researchers in the Netherlands said that radio waves from Elon Musk's Starlink satellites are creating a roadblock to peering into space. What are the challenges or ethical considerations here that should be top of mind for governments and private corporations? Yeah, the problem with um, this sort of proliferation of, of satellites, primarily like Starlink satellites, is that they reflect a lot of sunlight at sort of sunset twilight hours. That's when ground-based telescopes really want to like point towards a kind of region of the sun to try and find these potentially dangerous asteroids that we haven't spotted yet. So it's like there's huge graffiti streaks across the sky and it's impacting all kind of ground-based observatories. So morally, um, you would hope that people that design these satellites, and it's not just, you know, Starlink satellites, there's any private company that launches them would find ways to make them less reflective. Now, the technology to do that definitely exists, but currently it seems that these, it it, it appears to me that these companies are more interested in just getting their satellites up there, worrying about the consequences later, but they're already impacting ground-based astronomy around the world. Um, That also includes planetary defense efforts. So um, it seems a bit morally uh, sketchy to me to just keep launching them without thinking about the consequences. Asteroids aren't the only potential threats lurking in space. Are there any additional dangers scientists are equally concerned about? And how prepared are we for those? Scientists are not as concerned about comets as they are asteroids for one good and one bad reason. The good reason is that comets spend most of their time way further away from Earth than asteroids. Like most asteroids hang about sort of in the Mars to Jupiter region, and the ones near Earth obviously hang about a bit closer. There's just loads of more asteroids, so we have to be concerned about those. They're more likely to hit Earth. So we don't have to be worried about uh, worried about comets because the chance of a comet striking Earth is very low. However, if one were found coming towards Earth, at this point, there's, pr- there's basically nothing we could do about it. They're just too big, way too fast. Um, you know, it, what's that line from Armageddon? I know it wasn't a comet, but you could just fire every nuclear and just keep it should smile and keep on going. If that's basically true, so at the moment, like that would be a huge problem. But there's no evidence that any comet is anywhere close to heading towards us. So you know, it's not something we should really worry about. But once it's sorted out the asteroid problem, then they'll move on to comets. We know at least one devastating asteroid impact has happened before. Do you think the failure to act decisively on planetary defense now will inevitably lead to history repeating itself? Oh, I hope not. See, that's the that's the that's the concern. I mean, the fact that something like DART, like this deflection technique, is getting off the ground now, that's a good thing. Um, but you know, it's a matter of like, who's faster. <laughs> it's a race against something that we don't really know about. You know, is there an asteroid heading towards us? Don't confidently know this, know this yet. So the hope is that things like Neo Surveyor, and there's another ground-based telescope that will find so many asteroids called the Vera C. Rubin Observatory in Chile uh, that's coming online next year, actually. Uh, the hope is that we find all the dangerous space rocks, if they're there, before one hits us. So it's good that all this is happening. Um, but there is obviously a chance that we could get really unlucky and a city kid asteroid could find its way to hitting a city before we've spotted it in time. The hope is that, you know, we've acted fast enough. And I have to say on planetary defense, humanity is being a bit more proactive than it is for most global scale emergencies. So I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm, it's, a, it's, it's more of a feel good story at this point. I thoroughly enjoyed your book. It's called How to Kill an Asteroid. Robin, thank you so much for joining me on the excerpt. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for watching. I'm Dana Taylor. I'll see you next time.